Welcome everybody uh, to our brown bag, virtual brown bag lunch, well, what to expect when you're researching in a pandemic. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague, Kaylin Maybe, who saw a similar program um, put on by the Utah State Archives. And we're just shamelessly stealing that idea because we thought it was a really great, <laughs> great plan. So <laughs> thank you to them too. Um, today we have representatives from six Salem-based repositories and historical organizations, and we're going to be focusing on what they can offer you as a researcher um, during this time of upheaval. Just a real quick housekeeping note, um, I'm going to be recording this, this program, um, and it'll be available on, our, on the, pro, the uh, event page on our website, willamettheritage.org slash research slash pandemic after this, as, along with the slides, um, which have a lot of links uh, for folks to be able to link through and, and grab things there. Um, yeah, so we'll go through the presentation. We're going to go in alphabetical order by organization. And um, if we've got time at the end and people are willing and want to stay and ask questions, we'll do questions at the end. So I'm going to start it off with Laura. Wilt, who is the librarian at the o Oregon Department of Transportation Library and History Center. Well, thank, thank you. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll say one thing with the last name of Wilt, I think this may be the first time I, I end up in first in Q in an alphabetical listing. So this is great. <laughs> so I have been at the, the uh, Oregon Department of Transportation Library since 2004. I came there from a public library. I have my master's of library science degree from Emporia uh, University. Go ahead and click. Advanced. So the or ODOT library is a standalone agency library and lots of times folks are uh, surprised that a DOT would have a library but in fact most DOTs uh, have some type of library services either through their own library or through a state library or university. Uh, it, and ODOT, the library, is part of the ODOT research section, which is pretty par for the course for DOTs. It has a, so the, the research folks are my primary customers, but I offer library services to the entire agency and, and to the public as well. Uh, it's a very transportation and engineering. And most of the, the, for the most part, the collection is available to the public, though I, I reserve the, the uh, resources for uh, professional certification exams, and I keep those in-house. I do maintain a historic collection of AASHTO, uh, the American Association of State Transportation Highway Official Publications, as well as the Transportation Research Board publications. And lots of times those older ones are very difficult to find um, outside of the transportation libraries. Okay, go ahead and advance. The the library also includes a, a, a history center. And I do a fair amount of historic research for the agency and for the public as well. And some of the, the public uh, requests come to me through Ask ODOT, which if you go to the ODOT main page, it will let you send a request to Ask ODOT and they will, they will forward it to me if it, it's appropriate. And the History Center uh, has a collection of historic photos going back to the first state contracts in 1917. The commission was actually formed in 1913, but uh, at that point it was just a, a um, support for the counties. It, when it reorganized in 1917, we actually started doing state contracts. And so we have photos from, from that point on. We have files of information on highways, bridges, ferries, state parks, projects that have gone on. Uh, and additionally, I have access to internal databases that give me the right-of-way maps. And in the early days, particularly, they often had a great deal of detail in them and can be very helpful when you're researching portions of highways. And I also have access to the agreements and resolutions that were passed by the commission throughout time. So the History Center is open to the public by appointment because I'm a one-person operation during normal circumstances, but at this point, the, of course, the building's uh, closed to the public. Some of the requests may re 
require a public records request, which is a bit more formal way of sending a request in and, and can incur charges depending on how much research time is, is involved. Go ahead and click. And there's an agency history page and we'll see if that website will come up. <clears throat> and this has some, some short narratives on different milestones uh, in the history of the, the highway. And Kylie, if you want to go down to uh, the historic Columbia River Highway and click on that tab. So these narratives have a description, but they also have photos embedded in them. So the photos that are, are show there can be clicked on to go in, but if you go down to constructing a highway, and this this link may not work, but if you go down to where it, it goes to the Mitchell ton, Point Tunnel, if you click on that link, it should go to the Flickr page and give you these photos that, um, that uh, are part of the history center collection that I've put onto the Flickr page. For the most part, most of the, the requests are uh, digiti digitized on demand. So, and you can go back to the presentation. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, and then, oh, well, that's okay. There's another, there's another uh, tab on that website that has uh, its resources for historic re resource or re reference. And it will lead you to uh, digitize portions of biennial reports, uh, some of the older biennial reports, as well as other publications that talk about the history of the agency and, and the history of transportation in Oregon. It also contains a co the collection of state maps from about 19, I think it's 1919 to 2003. A couple of years ago, our GIS folks uh, let me send this, the files for those over to the state library and they put them on their catalog. So there's a link to those in the catalog. And there's some other historic information that might be of, of use for somebody doing re reference work work on, um, on highways. Go ahead and click. And the next slide is just my contact information. And you are, are welcome to email me. My phone should work. They've hooked it into the software on my computer, even though I'm working remotely. But uh, at, at any rate, this uh, the, the email will certainly work. And this is a, just a, a, an example of a photo. This is a striping uh, piece of equipment that was actually developed by an ODOT and, or highway department employee and was state of the art from the time. Apparently it was much, much uh, superior to anything of work, um, that was available commercially at the time. So that's, that's it. So we'll move along to the Oregon State Archives and Mary McRobinson, who is the reference unit manager um, over there. Mary, Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Control. <laughs> Great. Um, so thank you, Kylie, for inviting me to be part of this panel with my esteemed colleagues. And it's my pleasure to present on behalf of the Oregon State Archives. Um, I thought I had control. Is it working? Oops, let me try again. Approve. Hmm, do you just want to do it for me? Sure. OK, great. So I'll just say slide. Okay, great. So the Oregon State Archives was created by statute in 1945, and in the early 1970s, we were removed under the auspices of the Oregon Secretary of State. And the SOS is the office officially like who's the keeper of public records, so that kind of aligned our missions, which made sense. The reference unit is one of three divisions at OSA, and it's the outward facing. So um, we are statutorily required. It's our mission to make sure that we are um, identifying and collecting and preserving and providing access access to records created on our behalf by the government. So this includes all of the political subdivisions and all of the agencies for um, like in legal, administrative, and research purposes. And I've listed our authorities underneath there. Um, next, please. 
Okay, I thought I'd start off by saying what's not an OSA. So I just said that we are statutorily required to collect um, government records. So what you won't find in OSA are personal papers like diaries or that type of thing. Um, but what you will find in OSA is like almost like probably over 50,000 cubic feet of records um, documenting what the government does on our behalf as citizens of Oregon. And so um, here's just like a few samplings. So we have um, papers, we have journals and ledgers, we have photographs, we have audio materials. Um, but the key is, is that they are records that document. So it doesn't matter if it's electronic, um, it's, about the, it's about the content. So next. Okay, we even have records that predate the state of Oregon. So we have provisional and territorial records, which are gold wine for researchers. And um, here on the left, I have an example of probably the, probably like the most famous of our um, holdings. And that's the Oregon, the original Oregon State Constitution, which normally would be on display right now in celebration of Oregon's birthday, but due to COVID it's not. Other types of provisional and territorial records we have were reports that the governors were sending back to the U.S. government to report on what was going on. And then related to that, we're also the repository for official gubernatorial records. And so post-1991, you can find all of the official records that, um, that document the governor's agency um, at the Oregon State Archives. And prior to 1991, you can find some of them at the Oregon State Archives and others are in private institutions. And Su my colleague Susan might talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Some of our most popular and often used records are listed here. Um, we have census records, for example, created by the state of Oregon, by the federal government, as well as the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And these are a fantastic resource for documenting um, Oregon tribes. I'm not going to I'm not going to like read the list, but I did want to just take a second and talk about birth, death, um, marriage and divorce records. So. In the Oregon State Archives, if you're looking for birth records, we have records that are 100 years old or older. And then we have death, marriage, and divorce records that are 50 years old and older. If you're looking for more recent records or if you need certified records, then we refer people to the Oregon Health Authority. Um, but these are examples of some of our most used records. Slide. Okay, so um, the county records, um, we have 36 counties in Oregon, and we have an initiative whereby we try to visit each county on a rotating um, on a rotating basis, like every five years. So what we do is we go to the counties, we collect records that they're ready to transfer to the Oregon State Archives, and then we create inventories of what's still in their holdings. So there's about 70 different record series of which you can see just a few listed there on the screen. And what this does is it helps people know if they should contact the county for those records or if they can come find them at Oregon State Archives. So in addition to like letting folks know what kinds of records are there, we also have the contact information and and you can find all of those inventories online and available there. Slide. Okay, we have a significant amount of legislative records on our holdings, which is something that maybe um, kind of an average person might not think about, but we have the minutes, recordings, and original bill files that document the legislative proceedings. These are used mostly by attorneys as they try to um, glean legislative intent for, for their purposes. But I put this slide in here because I, I thought this was a good chance to talk about um, what archives have to do in order to make sure we keep records available in perpetuity. So on the the right are a photo, or like it's a photo of um, audio cassette tapes of which we have about 103,000. And then the left is a, it's called a Sawyer Rolls machine and it is a piece of equipment that was proprietary and is now basically um, obsolete. And so it's not just our job to provide access to these things, but we need to migrate and think towards the future of how we can always provide access to these records. Slide. Okay, so who uses OSA? Well, we would hope that everybody wants to use OSA, um, but top of our list of people that we help are genealogists. And then I would say second, we probably um, help attorneys. So again, using those legislative records, we help state agencies use their own records, but we also help folks that are using the records of other state agencies. So for example, like the Department of Justice, we have folks that use like the Rajneeshi records and things like that. 
Um, and of course, we welcome and encourage academics and avocational researchers. Um, we believe that strongly that our um, holdings are just kind of like a gold mine waiting to help people from like a social historian standpoint or from sociology or from a political standpoint, all of that. So we want to welcome everybody. Slide. Okay, so we have been closed to the public since COVID hit. Our normal hours are Monday through Friday, eight to noon and one to 4.45 p.m. And we hope to be open soon. We have staff just ready, willing and able to help. Um, but in the meantime, we are fulfilling requests remotely. So we have made huge efforts to try to provide the same level of access to records. Um, slide. So just to provide a couple stats um, since to kind of show the volume that we're still doing, we helped 756 government employees find their records. We helped almost 5,300 non-government. That includes Oregonians, people outside of Oregon, and even from other countries. And then we um, pulled almost 5,800 individual records that we provided access to. Slide. So we have a wealth of online resources um, that I would encourage people to visit our website to discover. We have a database that documents all of the individuals who lived in Oregon prior to statehood. We have an index that provides um, names of about 30% of our holdings. We have, um, we have a wonderful historic and scenic photo collection. We have guides that list all of like the, um, down to the folder level of the records we have. And then we have an online um, content management system where if we digitize records and we make them available, we put them online so they are easily discoverable and freely available to future researchers. Slide. Can you go to the next one, Kylie? Okay, so we also have a wonderful exhibit program. And unfortunately, our new exhibit was going to um, debut just as COVID hit. So we do have all of our exhibits online. So this includes our new one on suffrage. And I think there's about 12 total, including a wonderful exhibit we did in collaboration with Oregon Black Pioneers. And so I would encourage people to visit our website and explore those exhibits. Next. And you can easily find all of our contact information online. Um, we have a there's our email address. We have a phone number that takes you straight to the reference desk where we have um, experienced uh, and expert professionals waiting to help. We have an online form that's available. And then of course, we are looking forward to welcoming people back into our physical space, although we don't know when that will be. And final slide. So I guess if there's one takeaway, I just want people to know that if you are in doubt as to whether the Oregon State Archives can help you, I would encourage you to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, um, for that. And next up, we have uh, reference librarian Jerry Curry with the State Library of Oregon. Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me. I'm the mysterious one today. Um, uh, my camera works for all things. It usually works for Zoom meetings, too. I was on a MS Teams meeting earlier and it worked fine, but it is being very uh, stubborn today. So I didn't have time to reboot. So I will be the mysterious person, but I'm Jerry Curry. Um, I want to mention that our building uh, usually is open from one to four to the public, but of course we are working under COVID guidelines as well. So everything we're doing is also remote. We have kind of a skeletal staff that is working in the building. I'm physically in the building every day, so I can uh, touch the collection and fill requests for people. Um, but we could be reached at 378-8800 is our, um, our main reference line. And then below, you've got our main email address there. So slide. All right, I think we're going to try to do a little of a melange here, like I'll speak, but also we, I'd love to do some live stuff. Um, our main landing page is in the Oregon.gov environment. And Kylie, you could try clicking that link under our collections or, or on the main landing homepage. I think they're both live. And if not, we'll just go, we'll just forge right ahead. I will get them for you. It'll take a second. Okay. But uh, Oregon.gov is where basically all the state agencies live and um, including us. And if ever in doubt, you can just go to Oregon.gov slash library and that'll get you to the state libraries uh, pages that um, pretty much are for the public. I wanna talk just for a second about what the, the state library sort of specializes in. Um, you heard, uh, um, ah, just do library instead of state library, but I don't know why it did that. That's okay. That ought to work, great. 
It's thinking. Um, I did want to mention, uh, I'm very glad to see archives here, the difference between state archives and state libraries. State archives really is more um, of a records type of items, but uh, if you think about a state agency or a legislature or something coming together, um, working on a project, say like a salmon recovery plan or something like that, that group has to come together. They're probably going to do minutes of their meetings. They're gonna create drafts of the reports they're gonna create. And at the very end of it, they're gonna create a report. And that's what the state library specializes uh, in getting is we get state publications that the agencies create. The, the end result um, lives here. The other thing the state library has, uh, other things that we have are federal publications. And more and more state publications and federal publications are born digital. Um, so you're gonna find those through um, finding aids like our catalog and things like that. Um, we also have Oregoniana. So uh, both the natural and, and history of the state, monographs, books, and materials um, that, that address um, the history of our state, maybe the history of our region. And then uh, photographs. We have a, a nice photograph collection that probably the focus is from about the 1880s to about the 1930s or so. Um, anyway, in the Oregon.gov environment, as you can see, Oregon.gov slash library, I wanna draw your attention to the far right under our collections. And that's really where um, your interface is to us. There's a link to our federal government information, a link to the catalog that is public oriented catalog, a link to where you can just search for our state government publications, uh, a link where you can uh, look at our digital collections. And I'm gonna special or talk today about digital collections, special collections, and just a touch about state government publications as well. Because what I really wanna focus on is the stuff that you can find from your desktop. So if you go back to the uh, slides, I think. And then, like I said, digital collections, special collections, um, and state library catalog. Okay, next slide. All right, under digital collections, there's three things I wanna draw your attention to. Um, Oregon Index Online, Oregon Government Publications, and Oregoniana. The Oregon Index Online is prior to databases and prior to fancy schmancy things that we, uh, we found, um, you know, that you could find things, databases you could query online. Literally, there were armies of people that would go through the newspapers or through our collection and find things of interest and put them on three by five index cards. And those three by five in index cards kind of inhabit uh, what we used to uh, use as our large card catalog in the library. And if you all could come and we were open, I'd show you our, our, our um, alcove where these uh, three by five cards live in our old um, card catalog. But they're organized two ways. And what we did is we, we entered into a project with revenue and we scanned all of the cards. So the cards are all accessible like you were in our alcove, like you were in our building. And there's really two, a couple ways you can use the Oregon Index. One is kind of a browse. You kind of know what you're looking for. Um, so we have things organized by biography. So it's a name index in a sense. It is a name index or by subject. So on the far right there, you see 113 is just the, um, the drawer number. But under 113, uh, if you were a member of the Meek family or you were interested in early Oregon pioneers and you were interested in learning more about Joseph Meek, um, you can go, use that Oregon Index uh, link to go right in there, go to the Meek uh, area and just page through the cards. And that's gonna refer to items that we hold at the library that we can get for you. Sorry, my phone is ringing. And then under subjects, um, the, under um, drawer number 262, um, maybe one of your relatives was a Columbia River pilot or something like that in the past. And you wanna find out more information about Columbia River pilots. And again, uh, these, these cards will index uh, to something in our collection. Probably the, the thing that these index to the most are newspaper collections. And then the State Library holds a lot of microfilm copies, particularly of the Oregonian and the Statesman and the Oregon uh, the, the Journal, Salem Journal, uh, the Oregon Journal. And we can pull these things off microfilm for you. This Oregon index is also searchable. I'm not gonna have Kylie go back to show you a search, but you could search uh, in there and you can just type word, the word Deepwood if you are interested in that, uh, that physical uh, building and Deepwood, uh, it would show you the cards that refer to Deepwood and then you can write those citations down and ask the library to help you with it. Next slide. All right, uh, we also have Oregon government publications like I mentioned. And you actually can go in and if, if you're interested in just, um, you know, using library catalogs is, is a double-edged sword. Uh, they're amazingly helpful. 
uh, but sometimes they're so helpful that they bring back the world and uh, they can be frustrating. And there's lots of tips and tricks that librarians can tell you to help uh, you use library catalogs, like um, my favorite phrase, subject headings. But um, it's, it's difficult, it is. So if you know what you're looking for, sometimes it's just easier to drill in uh, by an agency. So say you were interested in the Oregon Department of Aviation, you could click that link uh, in aviation and then you could type the word independence and it's only going to find items um, related to the D Department of Aviation and the Department of Avionics before it and other things it used to be uh, under ODOT. And it will bring back uh, the airport information for independence as it applies to Department of Aviation. If I clicked agriculture and then done a search for independence, I might find things on the hop fields around independence, um, things like that. And if I click the business development one and type independence, I might find things uh, that the state has done to help the city of independence develop themselves uh, economically. Um, the other link is Oregoniana. And I think probably the best thing in that collection that would be useful to uh, researchers out there are our online voters pamphlets. We have uh, voters pamphlets scanned for the general election, the primary election, and the special election. And for Marion County, we have all three. So you can go in there and you, for basically since the dawn of time, since the, the voters pamphlets were started in the 1920, 1919 era, um, you can access these online. If you are outside of uh, Marion County or were interested in say something in Wheeler County or Curry County, to use a name I'm fond of, uh, we only have the general election scanned um, for counties outside of Marion. But you can go in there, read about uh, the candidates, maybe a, a, for a predecessor of yours ran for office. Uh, lots of times, lots of nice images, um, what they felt about certain things. The voters pamphlets are a very popular item at the State Library. Next slide. Under our special collections, we have a photograph collection. And you see uh, just kind of a, a snippet there of three type pictures we have. We've got a, a picture of the uh, Shimawa football team the Shimawa Indian football team. Uh, we got a picture of the gold man flat on his back at his last rest before they haul him up to the top of the Capitol dome. But you could do a search, for example, for Condi McAuliffe to tie into our ODOT friends. And you're gonna find pictures of say the Elsie Bridge in Walport. Or if you do covered bridges, you're going to find uh, pictures of covered bridges. And let me mention one thing about searching library catalogs or searching any of these collections about doing different kinds of searches. Um, I think the Google environment has made everybody kind of spoiled and they just want to type in, say, covered bridges. If you do that, you're going to find lots of information you're not interested in, say, uh, from insurance organizations or other state agencies because it's insurance coverage or covered, you're covered, and maybe something that's talking about bridging one program to another. So if you're really interested in covered bridges, think about using quotes on the end, covered bridges, you'll get a much narrower search and you'll get probably something you're actually interested in like the Elsie Bridge in Walport. Excellent. And the last thing I wanna mention is our state library catalog. It's going to link off to the left to our digital collections, our photograph collections and our special collections. And the state library is here. There are people here that can physically uh, retrieve the stuff, scan things that you need if it's still physical. But like I said today, I wanted to specialize more on the online resources that you have access to. Let us know what we can do to help. Like I said, we're kind of a dual agency in a sense. We serve uh, the citizens of the state, absolutely. But we do have a lot of data resources and stuff that are for our state agency clientele only. But we'll do our best to help you as, as we can. We work for you. And I'm Jerry Curry. I wish I could see you all and I wish you could see me. Uh, but I haven't had a haircut since February. So maybe that's the other reason I have uh, the, <laughs> the camera's not working. So uh, last February. All right, thank you very much. And if we can be of help, let us know. Thank you, Jerry. I'm gonna swoop in and take over for a second to talk about the Willamette Heritage Center. My name is Kylie Pine. I'm not Michelle Cordova, <laughs> like my screen says, uh, but I'm the curator and collections manager here at the Willamette Heritage Center. We're a five acre site in uh, Salem on Mill Street and 12th Street. Uh, we have a five acre site, 15 historic buildings, but I'm gonna talk today about the library and archives wing of our organization. The mission of the Willamette Heritage Center is to preserve and interpret the history of the mid Willamette Valley, uh, but our collections really do focus more on Marion County and the greater Salem area. With two exceptions, 
Uh, we do collect materials related to the Methodist mission to Oregon, which is more of a Pacific Northwest regional story. And we do collect materials related to Oregon's textile history, which is a little bit more statewide based. We have over 23,000 uh, three-dimensional objects, over 200,000 photographic images, thousands of books and archival collections. The one thing we do not have is a comprehensive online searchable database yet, something we're working on. Um, but we do have a very comprehensive internal database. Um, if you're interested in materials, um, we're very happy to do a search and to be able to send you back a PDF report that will list the materials in our collections. We just don't have the facilities yet to, for you to do that self-service on your own online. The one thing that we can offer is we do have collections materials. Uh, we've been digitizing some materials and um, putting together some finding aids and those can be found on our website, lamentheritage.org slash collections. But just do note that those are not comprehensive. Oops, got a little excited there. <laughs> so as with everybody, our research library is closed to drop in visitors, but we are trying really hard to facilitate as many uh, remote research requests as possible. Um, if you got a question, let us know. <laughs> Um, the easiest way to start the research request is to go online, willametheritage.org slash research. We've got a fill outable form at the bottom. Um, our preference is to do stuff as remote as possible, um, but we'll, we'll get you the information we can. We can do reference services that way, uh, let you know what, what's in our collection that might be available, and then we'll work together to figure out a solution for connecting you with those materials in a safe way. A few self-service options that we have, um, just wanted to make you aware of. Um, we found that we were getting a lot of similar research requests um, on, on topics. So we put together a series of web episodes on YouTube that focus on free research resources for Marion County um, that are out there. And these are designed for all ages. So apologize for any cartoony niche that might be in there. Um, but they, they really do walk you step by step through the free resources that are available to help answer some of those basic research questions. So there's about a 15 minute video and then we even have little uh, activity sheets that you can test your skills on if you if you want to check those out. Um, those are available up on our website. Um, if you're searching for materials and want to do some more self-service stuff, we do have a lot of stuff up on our website and blog. Um, I just draw your attention to this little uh, magnifying glass here. We've been doing uh, our best to try to index things and pull things together on the website. If you click on that, uh, a text box will open up and you can type in a search term and hopefully that'll pull up any blog articles or materials that have already been put together on your topic. Right there. We've also digitized a number of publications. Um, our newest journal, the Willamette Valley Voices, um, are available for free online on our publications page. We've also, um, our predecessor organizations, the Marion County Historical Society and Missionable Museum were prolific publishers. So we put together a, an index, a master index of those publications. And if you're looking for a person or a subject uh, in the mid Willamette Valley area, I highly recommend Checking, checking out this master index and seeing if the, somebody has already written something on it uh, might may help, help start your research project. We are so looking forward to the day when we can do research requests this way again in person. Um, we think it's great to be able to connect people in person with the resources we have. But until that time, um, check in with our, our, our website, willametheritage.org slash research or send us an email. And as of this morning, you can actually call us because our phone lines are back up. So um, that's how you can reach out to us. And we look forward to helping you as, as much as we can. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan Irwin, who is the University Archivist at Willamette University. Hey, thank you. Well, um, I've been at Willamette just under a year. I moved here um, in April of last year, right as the pandemic was starting. So um, uh, I think I now have a better handle on what we have. And if not, I always call Mary and she tells me what I need to know. So um, she's a wonderful resource. So uh, Willamette University Archives and Special Collections. So like all the other locations um, uh, were not open to the public. Um, the library is open on campus for current faculty, staff, and students, but the campus is closed to visitors during um, uh, the pandemic and for COVID. 
uh, reasons. Uh, so of course we're able to do uh, remote uh, reference, um, but to get a sense of what we have, uh, let me show you a few slides here. So the university just updated their website, so things have moved a little bit. But the URL at the very bottom here, which is uh, library. Um, .willamma.edu slash archives is our main, that's the main archives um, webpage, which will bring you here. You have a couple of options. You can um, search collections using the, the um, search box there. And uh, we have four main areas, collecting areas that you'll see uh, to the right. So we have the University Archives and Records, um, which documents the history of not just Willamette, but um, Salem and the general area. Um, for those who don't know, Willamette was founded in 1842. So um, about 17 years, is that right? Uh, before um, Oregon becomes a state. So a lot of old photographs that show the area. Um, so it's not just specifically uh, Willamette uh, related administrative records, although we have those. Um, I'm gonna jump around here. We have personal collections, uh, the majority of which have some tangential relationship to Willamette, um, but these are personal papers. They can include diaries, um, correspondence, uh, memorabilia, um, uh, publications. So it kind of runs the gamut. Our two larger areas, um, we have political papers so we have the papers of Senator Packwood and Hatfield um, and Smith. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we have all of the we have papers for all of the fifth district representatives um, up until the current. So these are very large collections. So the, the Hatfield and Packwood collections are probably about a thousand boxes each. That's a rough estimate. And uh, aside from political researchers and historical researchers, we have people who are doing all sorts of research in those collections. So there's a lot of information on um, environmental issues or um, public works or you know, dam construction, all sorts of different things. So whether people are really researching the individuals, they may not, but there's a lot of um, wonderful information just sort of thrown into these collections that um, sometimes are hard to find, but they're wonderful resources. Um, and then we have the Pacific Northwest Artists Archive, um, or for shorthand, we say PANA. Um, this is a wonderful collaboration with the Halley Ford Museum of Art on campus. And these are the personal papers and archives of a number of the artists whose um, art resides in the museum. And uh, different types of mediums, um, but all from the Pacific Northwest, all kind of um, either from the Northwest or doing artwork that represents more Northwest art. Um, so uh, from woodblock prints to um, sculptures to painting, uh, these are fabulous collections that we're really excited to have. If you go to the next slide, I think um, on the website, if you choose one of those four areas, um, this is how you can browse the collections. So um, on the left underneath, um, it shows the beginning of a list of the finding aids to the various collections. And before we go to the next slide, um, in the redevelopment of the website, they move some of the menu options. And if you see here on the right, um, if you had clicked on it, there's about the archives, Willamette history, services staff, records management, um, but there's uh, policies and information on there as well. It's just a bit more hidden than it used to be. So if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so underneath all of the finding aids for the print, or the, for the collections, then um, some on demand and some by grant, we have digitized a lot of materials um, from the various collections. So 
these are links to the uh, digital collections or materials from many of the uh, Northwest Artists Archive. So each, the personal, the university, the political and the uh, artists archives all have a digital component that you'll see below. Um, so this is a great way to get a, a sense of the type of art or what the type of materials in each of the collections. Um, so that paired with your finding aid is really helpful in trying to figure out what types of materials are in there. Um, let's see, uh, next slide I think it is. Okay, if you do a search, um, I did a search for Paulus, we have normal Paulus um, collection, and you'll see in the, in the search results, um, it'll give you specific collections, but over on the right, it allows you some different filters. So are you looking for digital records? Are you looking specifically for photographs? Are you looking for a specific name? And it allows you to filter down to maybe what you're looking for. Uh, so the uh, normally we would love to have people in the um, archives doing research. We do work with um, classes on campus. So we have students from the art department, English department, history, and other departments who come in and do use this um, in person uh, for the moment. But one of the best things to do when you're trying to find some of this information, if you go to the next slide, as always is to ask the archivist um, because we may not know the answer right off the bat, but we are gonna go find it for you if we can. So um, even though uh, visitors aren't allowed on campus, please reach out. Um, we'd be happy to help. Uh, there's a general email, archives at willamette.edu, and that goes to me and my colleague, uh, Elizabeth who's our processing archivist, and then my direct number and email. But um, I'm learning a little bit more each day as I do more reference. So please send me uh, reference inquiries and I'm happy to talk to you more about what Willamette University has. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Liz Tice, who is the president of the Willamette Valley Genealogical Society. Liz? Okay. I guess we are different than everybody else because we are small. We're not a government agency. We are a nonprofit that was formed in 1968. You know, and our mission was uh, promote an interest in genealogy by helping others with their research, presenting programs of family history, interests, and publishing records of Marion County. Um, it's been very difficult for us during a pandemic. <laughs> we do not have a, an office. We do have one we call our office, but it's just really storage. <laughs> That's, um, but, you know, we're hanging in there. <laughs> it's hard for 100 to 120, People that in our membership not all live here. We're open to members from all over, and we do have members from all over the country. So, um, and a few, you know, much smaller active, but we're getting by. So, the next slide. Um, we used to be at uh, the State Library, who I haven't seen Jerry since 2015. Um, we moved to Salem Public Library at that time. Uh, but right now, as you know, the library closed. They closed in um, March, of, I guess February, March, somewhere in there of 2019, moved to temporary quarters and now they're just closed. Um, so that was our only really public face was, uh, Salem Public Library. So we're kind of out of luck there. We had a large collection of 5,000 probably genealogy and history books. However, they're in the basement at Salem Public Library. We have some periodicals and family histories of our own, mostly uh, donated to us and a large collection thanks to uh, the state library that we were able to take when we moved. 
Um, those are not available to the public, but we have a list of those on our website and people who would be interested, we can retrieve them and make arrangements for some kind of an exchange. But we are hampered because everything's boxed and in the basement, you know. So the next slide, if you would go on. Um, but, you know, we had a desk there. We had a lot, you know, we had, you know, 1,200 people stop by our desk every year at Salem Public Library. It was very public space. They gave us a nice space, but we can't do that. Uh, however, our volunteers are like, love genealogy, very interested in genealogy, and they're like, we'll still help people figure out some way to, to do something. Uh, so even though the library is closed, which is where we have our public face, we are still working to help people. If you would advance the slide. Uh, we offer limited free research to uh, local people, residents of Pope Marion and Polk counties. Um, this, but we do research for people all over. In fact, uh, our person who does most of the research said he just got his first uh, research request from somebody in England whose family had lived here in the 1890s and then moved back to England. And he was looking for information during the time that they were here. So uh, we, we charge. Uh, and if you were to go to the research page on our uh, website, you would be able to download the policy and see what the fees are. So if you go to the next slide, Oh, didn't have it on this one. But, you know, we help with census records, birth records, anything having to, newspaper articles. It doesn't necessarily happen to have to do with uh, genealogy. It's, you know, anything that somebody thinks they, they want a, more information on. We subscribe. I'm sorry, I have to read my list here. We subscribe to uh, other sites to help us. And we've been adding more of those because we're doing everything online. Um, so we subscribe to, I don't know if it's on a slide, I'm looking through my list here. Um, we subscribe to newspapers.com, genealogybank.com, those are both mostly for newspapers, but they, you know, obituary is the biggest request, but anything that might've been a newspaper we uh, fold three for military records. Those are military records, mostly from the National Archives that they're uh, putting on there. Uh, American Ancestors is New England research. We subscribe to that. Uh, Family Tree Magazine, an excellent genealogy magazine. We subscribe to that. And next month, we're starting with a digital version. We haven't quite figured out how we're going to do that, but we will. Uh, Find My Pat is mostly English records. Ireland, Scotland, all of the British Isles, uh, we subscribe to that. Um, so we, we have a variety of things that we can access from home online to help people. Um, so if you would go to the next slide. Our website, instead of having to go to it, just did a picture of it. Uh, we do a monthly newsletter. Uh, we do a quarterly bulletin that has some local stuff, but also more general things. There's an article in this upcoming one about how to access um, veterans records, even you know more current ones at the National Archives. And then there's one for me about just unusual places to find records, things you should look for. Uh, we do special projects. Our most recent was updating Shamawa Cemetery and do it. We have that database on, we had done it about 25 years ago, and now we do have more information. The uh, Family Search has some of the National Archive records of their school cemetery, or school records, and what they died from. Anyway, we updated that and we posted that. Our research policy there. Membership, normally membership is uh, $25 for an individual for a year, $35 for a family. Um, for 2021, a big part of that for us is having a meeting and having local people and having a program. That obviously was uh, last February, was the last time we did that. So membership for this year, 2021, is free. 
So there is an interactive uh, form on our website or just a membership application that you could download and print out and send in. But uh, it's free this year if you want to try it to see what kind of benefits you have and what kind of things we have. Uh, this would be a good year to do it because it wouldn't cost you anything. Next slide. Um, our local Salem Public Library offers, has free access to Ancestry during the pandemic. So Ancestry.com, if you watch TV, even if you don't do genealogy, you know that's a biggie. You know, they advertise on everything. Um, but they are they subscribe to Ancestry and during the closure says our virtual services are still available. These systems require a library card and a PIN number for access. So if you are in this area and you have a library card, it doesn't have to be in Salem, it's in the, the, the whole system, the Chemeketa Cooperative Regional Library Service, um, you can access Ancestry for free. If you need help with that, we would, you can contact us and we'll help you uh, navigate through that, but the library system is pretty good. So quite a few people have been using Ancestry for free through the library during this pandemic. And this would be a time to take advantage of it while they're offering it free. And then you would be able to see whether you felt it was worth it or not. So that's really um, a good, good asset there. So next slide. Um, but yes, at the present time, the, you have to contact us through our email <clears throat> or you could mail us. That's really, you know, but it's amazing what you can find online these days. And so we work at it. We have all sorts of requests that come in and uh, not, not only our corresponding secretary, but our other people that used to volunteer at the library that have the bug and they can't get away from it, uh, keep contacting us saying, does she have anything for us to research? So we're very happy to help people. All right, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. That's great. So uh, that concludes the formal <laughs> presentation portion of our program. Uh, thank you to all of our participants uh, for being a part of this. I learned a lot. I hope you all did too. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, a uh, recording of this will be posted onto the uh, event webpage here along with the slides from all of the presenters with all of those great juicy links that they put in there too so that you can access those quickly. Um, I guess we can open it up to questions. If anybody has questions, um, ask away. Hi, Kylie. Can you hear me? This is Katie Henry. Hi, Katie. Okay, you can't hear me. I'm wearing, head I'm wearing headphones and I never know what's gonna happen when I do that. Um, I, I'm just curious um, if the types of requests you guys have received during the pandemic have um, been different than normal? Like what kind of information people have requested, whether it's been related in some way to pandemic stuff? Um, I don't know, I'm just curious if that, if any of that has come to light. I can answer on our behalf, there has been a lot of interest about past pandemics, um, 1918 flu and uh, uh, mask campaigns and those types of things. That was really popular probably in March, or April um, type of thing. So those are some of the more topical things that have come up. Anybody else? Uh, we're doing more things I think that patrons would do on their own usually, but since we're closed, there's more carrying the football down the entire length of the field instead of uh, them doing it. So I think that's the biggest change. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, before, we're, if somebody could come in, you could put it in front of them and let them kind of take their time with it. Um, now we just have to spend a little bit more time uh, doing some of that research uh, for them since they can't come in um, themselves. I think one thing I've noticed is that uh, uh, people have had a little bit more time on their hands because of the pandemic. And they they are kind of researching things that they maybe not had not had time to do before, and so they're they're um, they're 
kind of researching um, because they have time. <laughs> I think ours have pretty much remained about the same. You know, people are looking for, still looking for death records. We're kind of having to, we had to change because normally we go to the state archives to get the death certificate because if you go in person, it's 25 cents for a copy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we've had to either refer them to the state archives or see if we could find them some other way. But um, in general, genealogy is still the same type of questions, I think. And I would say at OSA, we've been fairly consistent. Yeah, the state agency stuff is pretty much the same. They're just not coming in physically, but they're still working remotely all around the state in their homes and some occasionally in their buildings. And it's the same stuff. And now with session, it's it's kind of the same too. So yeah, I hear you, Mary. <laughs> Thanks guys, that was helpful. I didn't actually, that piece you guys pulled out about the, your work in those requests has increased is interesting too. Any other questions? I'm pretty impressed that we have kept this to an hour. <laughs> I'm not sure that was going to happen. <laughs> so thank you to all those participants. Um, like I said, you'll have, have contact information and I'll post these things up on that, that willametteheritage.org slash research slash pandemic. If you need any information, uh, please reach out. I think that was the one thing I heard a lot <laughs> from everybody is we're here and we want to help. So please do it. Thank you so much to our participants um, and for everybody for showing up and being a part of this. I really appreciate it. Um, stay warm. <laughs> stay safe. Thank you, Thank Kylie. You. Thank you all very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.